Okay, I guess we can get started. Today, we're happy to have uh, Nikolai Bobev uh, from Leuven in Belgium. And uh, take it away. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for organizing this interesting series of, of, of online seminars and for inviting me to speak. Uh, so I think I might be the first speaker who's going to talk about holography, probably. I haven't checked in detail, but anyway, one of the few speakers who's going to talk about this. So I'll try to, to, to keep it simple for now. Um, OK, I'm going to talk about work uh, uh, that I did with these people that you see on the picture. So Anthony and Val are postdocs in Leuven, and Kirill is a researcher in Sofia. Um, and by the way, uh, I'd, like, I'd like it a lot if you interrupt me and ask questions during the talk so that it doesn't feel like I'm speaking into the void. Okay, good. So what's the motivation for the talk? Um, so there's like three points of view that you can take for the questions that I'm, I'll be asking. Uh, so one is to study corrections to classical two derivative supergravity. Uh, these should be arising from string or M theory. Uh, uh, another point of view is that usually when we study holography, we, we keep uh, the leading order in, in some large N expansion on, on the gauge theory side, and that should presumably be matching to classical two derivative supergravity. But of course, you should be asking what happens in subleading order in this large N expansion. And finally, if you're interested in black hole physics and quantum gravity, again, you might be interested in corrections to the you know, leading order black hole thermodynamics, black hole entropy, and so on. So these will be the, the broad motivations uh, behind uh, this talk. Uh, and so more specifically, I'm going to talk about something uh, concrete, which we did in the context of uh, 4D supergravity and 3D CFTs. OK? So soon as, as we move on, I'll be very specific what, what is exactly the system I'm going to study. So, I mean, of course, these questions are not new, uh, far from it. Uh, it's well known that uh, higher derivatives uh, corrections to 10D supergravity should arise from string loops uh, in some way. And in 11D, things are a bit more mysterious. But again, there should be some corrections to 11D supergravity. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, those ha have been computed in some cases uh, with various tools. Uh, but in general, of course, it's, it's hard to calculate all of these explicitly. Uh, specifically, I'll be interested in what uh, happens in M-theory for corrections to 11D supergravity uh, and uh, how they affect these asymptotically locally ADS4 times X7 type of solutions where X here is some Einstein manifold. And I'll be assuming that it, it has a certain amount of, of SUSY preserved, which means that it will be a Sasaki Einstein manifold. Uh, and so again, this will be the, the contact point for holography and M2 brains and 3D CFTs. Uh, so, OK, it, even if you manage to compute the coefficients of these corrections in, in 11D, you still have uh, uh, s some work to do, which is not easy, uh, which is to start uh, computing VPS equations from this action and equations of motion. And things get ugly very quickly because uh, the leading order correction in 11D is actually eight derivatives. So the equations of motion are a mess. Uh, OK. So uh, overall, yeah, I think it's fair to say that at least in the context of asymptotic ADS solutions, this has not been pushed very far. I should mention recent work by Silvio Hufu and, and friends that is kind of orthogonal in spirit to what I'm going to say here. Uh, OK, so uh, we decided to approach this in a slightly different way. 
we kind of embrace our ignorance here. So we go to four dimensions. So we're assuming that there's some explicit reduction from 11D on this manifold X7, which will lead you to some 40 gauge supergravity. Uh, and I will keep N equals to two supersymmetry. Uh, and I'll be asking, what are the corrections in, to this 40 supergravity actions? Can I somehow constrain them and study them directly in 40? Uh, and so the, the logic here is that, of course, you can start doing this, but you have to be a bit smart how to organize it and how to compute the coefficients in 40. So I cannot use any str st string theory or any kind of uh, duality arguments, at least I don't know of any, uh, how to compute the coefficient. So I will appeal to holography uh, to, to compute them using the dual gauge theory. Uh, and this is, uh, the, this works very well in the specific case in which the 40 supergravity has only one multi-platon shell, which is what's called the the gravity multiplet. So th this is the multiplet in 4D supergravity that is dual to the energy momentum tensor multiplet in the dual CFT. So this will be the main ingredient in the story. So in this way, I should presumably be computing things that are universal at large n for uh, the dynamics of the CFT. Uh, and, and we'll see how, how this works in detail. And so this, approach a priori can be argued to be probably uh, viable using large n arguments in holography, uh, consistent truncations, but b both of these are not rock solid as far as I know. Uh, but if you wish, you will see that things work out very nicely. And so you can argue also a posteriori by saying that things work nicely. So you should uh, probably believe in the story and don't avoid. Uh, okay, so uh, here's the plan of the talk. So I'm done with the intro and motivation. I will briefly explain the logic of this um, 40 supergravity analysis. I'll be sparing you most of the details uh, that they're not very pretty, depending on what you like, of course, but uh, yeah, they're a bit ugly. Then we'll move on to, to see what are the, the implications of these things to holography. Uh, then I'll talk briefly about black hole entropy and thermodynamics, and then we'll see how to connect all of this to 3D CFTs. Uh, okay, and as I said, you should interrupt me and ask questions at any point in time. Are there any questions now? I'm also assuming that you can hear me, so you will interrupt me if you can. Okay. Good. Uh, okay, so a lightning introdu in introduction to conformal supergravity. So the formalism we'll use, it's called, it's called conformal supergravity. And there's recently been a book published on this by two people in Leuven, so I should advertise it. Edo was my student and Tuan, you all should know. Uh, he's an expert in supergravity. So, the basic idea here is that you start with the conformal algebra in, in a given dimension and a given uh, amount of supersymmetry and you make it a uh, local symmetry. So, uh, and in this way you construct what's called conformal supergravity. And then this thing, you can uh, phrase it in superspace, you can couple it to multiplets and there's a whole, um, you know, uh, machinery how to construct actions. Uh, and in general, uh, if you want to study matter coupled supergravity, so in addition to this minimal ingredient, which is called the vial multiplet or the gravity multiplet, you want to put in matter fields, things are very nasty and there are free functions, the prepotential, the Kähler potential and so on, which you have to fix. And then the, those things are gonna get modified as you, as you go to higher orders in derivatives. Uh, however, we'll study, as I said, what's called minimal supergravity. So 40 N equals to two minimal supergravity, which contains only the gravity multiplet on shell. Uh, and these three functions will actually be constants. So the ingredients to start constructing actions for this model include, as I said, the vial multiplet, 
So if you know 3D n equals to two CFTs, this is, if you wish, the gravity dual of the energy momentum mode. So it contains the metric in four dimensions, which is due to the energy momentum tensor, some AC2 times U1 gauge field, uh, which is due to uh, R symmetry, and so on and so forth. And so th this, of course, is not the full story. I have to somehow uh, 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 fix the conformal symmetry, because otherwise I'm going to have ghosts in supergravity. And so you use these so-called compensator multiplets, so a vector and a hyper. Uh, and you kind of combine them with this abile multiplet into one big gadget, and then you gauge fix, and at the end of the day, you'll find what's called an on-shell action. On-shell here means on-shell with respect to this conformal symmetry. Okay, so then, for those of you who haven't seen this, the end result of this operation will be the usual Poincaré supergravity actions, for the propagating degrees of freedom. Uh, in addition, that you, you, you have a choice here whether you gauge this U1 or not. This will lead to gauged sugra. So this is the thing that we want to study in the context of anti visitor space. So if you want a potential in the story, if you want a cosmological constant, you have to do this kind of gauging. Okay, so this is like a two minute explanation of what goes into the story. Uh, and I'm not gonna show you any of these details. So he here is a bunch of claims that we think are true. So first of all, there is a unique uh, two derivative supersymmetric invariant. So there's a unique action, which is good. This is essentially the bosonic part of this action is Einstein-Maxwell with a negative cosmological constant. As you increase the order of derivatives, there are two in, independent invariants. They have weird names, vial squared and T log. So these you can think of as F terms. In addition, you could worry about D terms and those in principle exist if you have extra matter fields, but in the case which we study, which is the minimum supergravity, they do not exist, one can show. It was done in this work. Um, another thing that's important is that uh, it, these fields here, uh, this uh, vector and hyper multiplet, and also this file multiplet, contains a bunch of auxiliary fields, but they're auxiliary at the two derivative level. At four derivative, they'll actually have strange kinetic terms, so they will contribute extra propagating modes. In addition, uh, for holographic and on-shell reasons, uh, on-shell action calculations, I will be interested in Euclidean signature in the bulk. Uh, and so I will make use of this um, nice uh, paper from Ute. Okay, so the, this is all that's going to happen in 4D supergravity in words. And here is some equations, which is essentially the outcome of, the, of, of all of this analysis. So when you do all of this, you obtain an action, which I'll call LHD. So HD here includes up to four derivatives. Uh, and so the first term is the, the usual two derivative action. And then there's these two um, extra invariants, if you wish, and they have arbitrary constants in front. I call them C1 and C2. So if, if I was powerful enough to begin with M theory and include all corrections to M theory and reduce on some manifold X7, I could in principle compute these constants, but I'm not going to do that. I will keep them arbitrary and I will keep in mind that eventually they will be determined by the specifics of this manifold and the specifics of the corrections to 11D supergravity. So I have a question. Uh, yes. Are these related to the A and C coefficients of the holographic dual? Oh, very good. So here, the, the holographic dual will be a 3D CFT. So uh, th they're not related to A and C because this thing doesn't have anomalies. But if you wish, these will be related to the three-point functions of the energy momentum tensor. 
uh, if you if if you want um, formulation in the dual safety. So the coefficient here of the two um, derivative term will be related to uh, the two point function, and this will be the three point function. Does this answer the question? Yes, thank you. Uh -huh. Okay. Good. So uh, he, here is how things look in, in a little bit more detail. So I, I'm going to write only the bosonic terms. Uh, fermions exist. You should add them, but you know, I'll, I'll spare you the details. So as I said, the leading order piece is you know, Ricci scalar, a cosmological constant, and a U1 gauge field. So this is really uh, Einstein Maxwell. And the coefficient is just G Newton, uh, 1 over G Newton. Uh, the corrections have a specific form. We have massaged them in a certain way. So this piece, LGB here, is uh, entirely built out of the metric of the Riemann tensor, and it's the usual Gauss-Bonnet density. Uh, and then this vial square piece contains the vial tensor C here, as well as uh, contractions of of the Maxwell field or uh, the anti-self-dual and the self-dual piece of the Maxwell field and then derivatives. Okay, uh, uh, so the constants in this action are G Newton and L. So G, G Newton is the Newton constant, L ultimately is the scale of ADS4 or the, the value of the cosmological constant. So out of G Newton and L, I can make a dimension less ratio. And then C1 and C2 are dimensionless constants, which, as I said, I'm keeping unfixed at the moment. And I want to study how things depend on C1 and C2. OK. Uh, something very nice ha happens with this action now. You can check uh, something non-trivial is that because these terms here, there's many, many terms in uh, vial square are related in a very specific way. So if you didn't have Susie, all of these terms will have an arbitrary constant in front, but Susie relates them and organizes them into one constant, which I call C1 minus C2. And because of this, uh, you can show that every solution of the two derivative action, this uh, usual Einstein Maxwell here, is also a solution of the bigger action, which includes this horrible other pieces. Of course, the inverse is not true. So there could be independent new four derivative solutions, but uh, I'm going to use this uh, diagram over here that every two derivative solution is necessarily also a four derivative solution. So si similar claims have been uh, made uh, in the con in similar context without Susie by these two people, as well uh, as by Anthony and Tim Larson in the context, the context of asymptotically flat supergravity. Okay, in addition, Susie is also preserved, meaning that if you have a two derivative solution, which is BPS, it will be also a solution and it will also be BPS in, in, in a bigger model with the corrections. And again, for the rest of the talk, I will be excluding everything that sits in this kind of pink region here. There could be new interesting solutions, which we uh, haven't, haven't explored in detail. OK, so the logic will be choose your uh, favorite solution of Einstein Maxwell, and give it to me, and then I will analyze it and spit out how the corrections from this C1 and C2 affect various observables in this uh, 4D supergravity. This will be the logic of the talk. Uh, any questions? OK, good. So this is all I had to say about 4D supergravity. So again, I have an action which, which is explicitly known, and it's given here. And, and then I'm going to study solutions of this action, and I'm going to interpret them in the dual CFT. And I will also study black holes. And I'll see how this C1 and C2 affect physical observables. Ajay, I have a question, sorry. Yes. 
So um, does this just happen? I mean, the, this fact that the solutions of the second order equations of motion also solve the fourth order. So does this just happen? Is it an observation or is, uh, is there, um, how to say, more sophisticated understanding? Um, I, I, unfortunately, I cannot give you uh, like a one line slogan. I can tell you that this is certainly no longer true if you study in five dimensional supergravity, we have explored that. Um, it is no longer true if you add matter fields, like ah. vector multiplets, uh, additional scalar fields and so on. So it certainly is some kind of specific uh, miracle, if you wish, for this minimal supergravity. I guess this is what I wanted to ask them. <laughs> right, okay, uh, good. Uh, so let's go a little bit into holography and see how all of this affects the story there. So uh, the logic here will be that I will focus for the next few, few slides on the on-shell action. So again, I, I want some asymptotically ADS4 solutions of Einstein-Maxwell, and then I want to compute its on-shell action. The reason is that it's dual to the partition function, the path integral of the dual QFT, the path integral without any sources inserted. Uh, and to compute this, uh, you, you first need a solution, but then in addition, you have to worry about uh, divergences arising from the UV region of the solution. So it's asymptotically ADS4, I have a boundary. As I approach this boundary, this on-shell action is going to diverge, so I have to cancel the divergences. And this is a well-known operation that's called holographic renormalization. Uh, and it's somewhat non-trivial when you have higher derivative terms, uh, but otherwise it's relatively standard. Uh, something that, that's gonna make our lives easier. Uh, so there are two important facts. One of them I've already mentioned that the two derivative solutions are actually also solutions of the bigger theory with higher derivative terms. And the other fact is this relation between the on-shell Lagrangians that I showed you. So I will be the on-shell value of this L that I showed you before. So here is the Lagrangian from it, which I have an action, and then the on-shell value of this action will be called I. And so there's this nice identity which is valid on-shell on using equations of motion. Okay, so then what you have to do is to the Lagrangians that I showed you to the, to the actions there, you have to add boundary terms that are gonna cancel the divergences which you have, uh, which arise from the ADS4 boundary. And here are the terms which you have to use. So the first line here is very well known, uh, given Hawking term, a cosmological constant on the boundary, the Ricci scalar of the boundary metric. So, this is a very standard story. This term is slightly less known. It's you need it when, whenever you have a gauss bonnet density. I think it was understood by Rob Myers in 1987. So he was asking, what is the analog of the Gibbons Hawking term when you have this gauss bonnet term added to the einstein maxwell theory? Anyway, so the, these are explicit expressions that you have to use to find a finite on-shell action. And here is the final answer. So you, you put all of this, you turn the crank, you have very good friends who can compute without a single mistake, and you'll find an equation that you, you can put in a box or on a t-shirt if you like. Uh, and he, here it is. So this is the on-shell action regular, regularized for any solution, any two derivative solution of this big action that I showed you before. It depends on the constants in the problem, C1, C2, as well as L square and G Newton. Uh, the pieces in red, so this F, curly F in red, is simply the regularized on-shell action of the original Einstein-Maxwell theory. So this is the thing that many people have been computing since holography was found. And chi, is some kind of regularized or uh, uh, you know finite Euler characteristic of this non-compact four manifold. Okay, and so 
this is all there is. So it's a pretty nice compact formula, which allows you to compute these on shell actions. Uh, so here's how it works on a bunch of examples. So as I said, this works for all uh, solutions of the Einstein Maxwell equations, but uh, so this is independent of SUSY, this equation. So the theory is has n equals to two SUSY, but the solutions, of course, may not have it at all, maybe non-BPS, but this equation in the box is still valid also for those solutions. Uh, the table here contains essentially we think an exhaustive list of analytic BPS solutions of 4 the n equals to two supergravity, at least to us, this is an exhaustive list. Maybe other people will know more solutions, but anyway, this shows that you can com uh, compute these f and chi explicitly for all of these examples. So the first line here in, in red is just ADS4, uh, Euclidean ADS4 with S3 boundary. Uh, the other three lines are different squashings of this S3 manifold. So this, the first line is with the round S3 metric. And then these three other lines are various ways to squash the metric on S3 uh, while keeping supersymmetry. Uh, this line here is current Newman ADS in 4D. So this is a rotating charge, the ADS4 black hole, which admits a BPS limit. So this, in the BPS limit, you only have one quantum number, the rotation, which is independent. And so this on-shell action depends on that. And chi is just some topological invariant, if you wish. Uh, uh, this, these other solutions is, if you wish, this ADS2 times the Riemann surface. Well, I call Romans here. Most people are gonna call ADS4 an eisner nordstrom this is like the SUSY limit of that black hole. And there's also some specifically Euclidean solutions that we also study. Okay, the solutions are, have, uh, are coming into two categories. The first category is what people call a nut. Uh, this essentially means, so you have a killing spinner out of which you can construct a canonical killing vector. And as you go from the boundary of ADS into the bulk, the killing vector may have fixed points. Uh, and if the, the fixed locus is a point, this is called a nut. So the topology then is R4 near that fixed locus. And if the fixed locus is a two manifold, it's called a bolt. And then locally, the topology is this here. So the first five lines are nuts and the three lines are bolts. Okay. The solutions in red, I'm going to study uh, further now. I'm, I'm gonna show them to you. So just to point out that when I take this solution in the second line and I put B to one, I recover empty ADS. So this squashed sphere is smoothly connected to ADS4. Okay, so he, here is the squashed sphere. Uh, it's a bit ugly, but it's an explicit analytic uh, background, I have the 4D metric with some functions F1 and F2, depending on two uh, variables, X and Y. Uh, so if you wish the radial of ADS is some combination of X and Y, which is a bit nasty. Uh, psi and phi are two U1 vectors, killing vectors, uh, which are you know capturing the invariance of this S3. Uh, and when you put B equals to one, so this F here is the gauge field. If you put B equals to one, this whole thing is just ADS four in strange variables. Okay, the other solution that I'm going to, 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 to study is this Romans solution, which is essentially Euclidean reisner nordstrom BPS. Uh, it has a Riemann surface. Kappa is, is the normalized curvature of the Riemann surface. So if it's a sphere, kappa is one. If it's a torus, kappa is zero. And if it's hyperbolic, kappa is minus one. Uh, the reason I'm emphasizing these explicit solutions is first of all, to show that we can do things explicitly, but also these are of interest for the dual CFT where using localization, 
you can compute the partition function of many CFTs on this squash test three at large n, uh, as well as on this, the boundary here is S1 times the Riemann surface. And this goes by the name of topologically twisted index, uh, which can also be computed explicitly in many cases. So we'll see both of these appearing later on in, in, in the talk. Good. Um, any questions about these explicit solutions? Okay. Interrupt me if any questions come up. Uh, good. Another very standard observable, which I've already, already mentioned, is this two-point function of the energy momentum tensor, canonically called CT. Uh, CT you can compute essentially by doing a scattering of two gravitons in ADS4. Uh, and this is a standard analysis for Einstein gravity, which is this leading term here in CT. Uh, when, when, when you have a, a higher derivative term in the curvature in, in this action, you have to do a little bit more work. And this was done in a paper from 2014 by Sen and Sinha. And we used their analysis and translated to our action and we found this. So the, uh, as I said, C1 and C2 should encode information about this internal Sasaki-Einstein manifold, which presumably encodes information about the dual CFT. Uh, L square over G Newton should be uh, also controlling information about the volume of the Sasaki-Einstein manifold, which again controls the dual CFT. So this is how you map uh, SUGRA numbers to CFT numbers. Okay, so this is valid for, for all 3D CFTs that have a weakly coupled ADS4 n equals to 2 SUGRA dual. Uh, good. And there's a consistency check that we can do. So if you wish, this calculation of CT is done by scattering of two gravitons in ADS, but I can also use a nice word identity due to n equals to 2 SUSY, which relates the coefficient CT to derivatives of the squash sphere partition function. So you can compute this partition function S3 by this on shell action, differentiate it twice with respect to the squashing parameters. This brings down two powers of the energy momentum tensor, and you integrate it over the volume of the sphere, and you get CT. So this was shown in a paper from a few years ago by these people. Uh, and indeed, using the results from the table that I showed you, you can find that this answer, uh, you get it on the nose from this on shell action. So if you wish, it's an independent confirmation that what we're doing is making a lot of sense. Let me see if I understand anything. The six derivative terms would give you a contribution of order G Newton over L squared, is that correct? Um, uh, it, this will be one of, of the contributions. So I will uh, discuss later on specific examples from N2 brains, if you wish. For N2 brains on uh, Calabian fourfold, the leading piece will be N to the three halves. The subleading will be N to the one halves. And the piece that you had in mind will be N to the minus one halves, which will be indeed uh, coming from uh, what you said. And then, there will be a log n piece, which will come from studying loops in ADS4. I'm not going to see it in, from a non-shell action analysis. But I'll have some comments on all of this later on. OK, so another thing that's kind of cute to study is to ask, what is the spectrum of fluctuations around ADS4? So when you have Einstein Maxwell, things are easy. Well, obviously you have a massless spin two multiplet, which has the metric spin two, the gravitino spin three halves, and the gauge field, the gravity photon, which is spin one. These things have, so I've organized this in the language of the dual 3D CFT, where these things are mapped to operators. So S is the spin of the operator, delta is the dimension, the conformal dimension, and R is the R charge. And you see here the standard uh, 3D n equals to 2 energy momentum multiplet. 
However, when you include these extra fields, as I said, the auxiliary, what used to be auxiliary fields in uh, the two derivative supergravity now have kinetic terms. So this means that there will be extra propagating modes and actually a lot of them. And here are they all. Uh, so they form a big multiplet. So what you do is you take ADS4 and you study the fluctuations of all the fields in your conformal supergravity. That's a big mess, but the big mess organizes in a very nice way, as it should, because of n equals to supersymmetry. So the bosonic modes which you find are a scalar, spin zero, six uh, spin one fields, vector fields, and one massive spin two field, as well as a bunch of fermions. And the dimensions or the masses in the bulk or the dimensions in the dual CFT are controlled by a single number, a little delta, and they're shifted as they should be by, uh, you know, to organize in a multiplet. Delta is given by this combination here. Uh, and, um, uh, well, unitarity imposes that there's a lower bound on this quantity. Okay, so unitarity, roughly speaking, because uh, L square over G Newton is much, much bigger than C1 minus C2, this implies that C1 minus C2 should be a positive number, roughly speaking. Okay, if just to, to give you a uh, preview of what this implies for ABGM and related models is that if, if you take N2 brains and if N is large, the, this multiplet, the operators in this multiplet will have dimensions that scale as n to the power one half. So these are not going to be the usual Kutza Klein modes coming from the reduction of 11D Sugra on, a, um, on an Einstein manifold. So these will be some uh, higher derivative Kutza Klein modes, which to the best of my knowledge have not been studied at all. Uh, okay, so um, are there any questions? So if you wish all of the things I said in the past 20 minutes or so uh, are predictions for 3D CFTs uh, of the class that arises from M theory on, on a Sasaki Einstein manifold. Can you, say, can you say more? What do you mean higher derivative because of the coin modes? What I mean, uh, good. So this is not also standard terminology. Uh, what I mean is that 11D supergravity will have some eight derivative terms. And re uh, so I'll have some action in 11D that has the usual two derivative terms and all these eight derivative terms. And when I reduce this action from 11D to 4D, uh, there'll be propagating modes associated with, these, with all of these terms. And so there'll be the usual Kaluza Klein tower computed in 84 or something uh, coming from the two derivative terms, but also these other eight derivative terms will have their own propagating modes and Kaluza Klein modes. So if you wish, I'm computing some very specific multiplet of those modes. Does this make sense? Uh, no, I'm, 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 I'm still confused. Because those eight derivative terms I constructed with a metric and other fields yes. already. Yes, but so you should I, be careful. You should be, be careful because the minute you include eight derivative terms, in addition to the massless graviton in 11D, you have additional massive gravitons in 11D. So you, just, just like in, in 2B supergravity, if you include alpha prime corrections, I'll get extra uh, massive spin two modes. This is I couldn't understand though that some modes which are higher up that come down. I mean, I don't know what you mean by higher up. Maybe we can talk about this. Okay. Ibu, he's just saying that the propagate, if you want the propagator, it's higher order, so it will have more folds. Right. So these will be like, whatever. Regime modes in M theory. I don't know how to call them. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, maybe <laughs> we can discuss later. I, I understood that statement. Okay. 
I, just to point out, so if, you, if I take an operator in the usual kaluza klein tower, uh, the dimension of, of the dual operator is going to is not going to scale with n. The dimensions will be like over here in the first table. There'll be two, five halves, three, uh, five, seven, whatever. There'll be order one, all of them. And then there'll be a gap, and then there'll be these modes. So I'm capturing one of these multiplets above the usual closer coin gap. Okay, black holes. Uh, here again, we can say some very general things because uh, we are standing on the shoulders of giants, as, as people say. Uh, so it's very well known. So for the moment, so, so far, everything I've told you is in Euclidean signature. Uh, now I'm gonna move to Lorentzian so that I can talk about black holes. Uh, it's well known how to compute the entropy uh, of a black hole in 4D when you have higher derivative terms, you have to use the formalism of Wald. Uh, essentially what you have to do is you have an action, you have to vary the action with respect to the Riemann tensor, you find a certain object E, A, B, C, D, and then you contract this object with uh, by normals to the horizon. So H is the horizon, H is a 2D surface, and you compute this, gadget and it's supposed to give you the entropy. That's you know, a one minute explanation of what Walt did and many other people afterwards. And so we did this and here's the final answer. So you, you'll find an entropy. So you find a correction to the usual, to the coefficient, to the one quarter coefficient of the beckenstein hawking term. So this alpha is related to C2 and C1 and G Newton and the cosmological constant. And then an additional correction coming from uh, the topology of the horizon of the black hole. So this is the full answer for our, our model. And again, I'm emphasizing that this answer is independent of supersymmetry. So it's valid for the Schwarzschild black hole also. Okay, uh, so th that's all about entropy. Uh, you can of course keep on going and compute conserve quantities using the standard Comar integrals and conserved currents. Uh, your action is modified, so your conserved quantities will be modified in general. So for example, I've outlined here how things work for the Maxwell field. Uh, you have the Maxwell equations, but this G now is computed with respect to the uh, uh, higher derivative action. And so I have to integrate these two forms over a two surface at infinity, the, the boundary of a surface at infinity to compute the charges. So P is the magnetic charge. It is not affected by the higher derivative terms because F is the same. Uh, however, G or Q is affected. And the answer is very simple. It's right over here. So you have some black hole with a certain electric charge. And all that happens is that by adding all of these higher on derivative terms, the charge is, it, is modified by this alpha, which just to remind you is this quantity here related to the C1 and C2 coupling. You can go ahead and do the same for uh, Comar integrals, for the mass uh, and for the angular momentum if you have any, and they're corrected in exactly the same way. They have their classical value and then this alpha is, if you wish, the four derivative modification of these conserved charges. Okay, uh, to check that we know what we're doing, we, we did an additional painful calculation. Well, not so painful. Uh, uh, there's this thing called quantum statistical relation, which in the context of asymptotically flat black holes was studied by Nogimas and Hawking. Uh, for asymptotically ADS, I think this is the paper, at least the one I know that, that studied this thing. So the relation is basically that the on shell action of the black hole should be equal to this right hand side. Uh, here, beta is one over the temperature, m is the mass, t the temperature, s the entropy, phi the electric potential, q electric charge, omega is the angular velocity, and j is the angular momentum. So this thing should hold in general in quantum gravity 
or semi-classical quantum gravity. Um, and th this is well known to hold at the two derivative level, and we've shown that it holds in our case also. Essentially, the logic is that these things, uh, the intensive quantities are not modified, the extensive ones, uh, the action, the entropy, the mass, the charges are modified as I showed you. And when you add things up, uh, this identity is obeyed, provided that the Euler character of this four manifold is the same as the Euler character of the horizon, which is true on all black holes. We didn't furnish a general proof here, but I, yeah, I think it should, it should be possible to do. This okay. Is is it the question, is this again making use of the, the idea that you have two derivative black hole solutions? Yes. Are yes. Yes. Solutions absolutely. of the four derivative equations? Yes, absolutely. So I'm not claiming that we have checked this for general, for genuinely new solutions of the four derivative model. We have checked it for only for the two derivative solutions of the bigger action. Good question, good point. Uh, final comment, uh, people are, have been writing papers about weak gravity conjecture. Uh, you know, people have been moving from equations to inequalities. So uh, here we have something to, to, to say about this. You know, it's clear from what I showed you that Q over M uh, is not going to be modified. Uh, so the extremality uh, is not affected if you wish, but the entropy is affected. So the entropy is modified uh, in, uh, by this alpha, but also by an extra piece in the action, C1. Um, so effectively, this means that there's no, at least in this model, there's no correlation between extremality bound and the sign of the correction to the entropy. This is just a comment. All right. Uh, this, I think, is all I had to say about black holes. So let's move to quantum field theory a little bit. Uh, okay. So as I said, I will focus on M2 brains at large n. What I mean is this class, this very well-known class of examples in ADS CFT, where you put M2 brains on a conical Calabial fourfold. Uh, and then at low energies, this presumably will flow to some 3D CFT, uh, which is going to look something like uh, Chern Simons matter theory, like ABGM style CFT. Okay. Uh, what we know about this CFTs is how their uh, free energy scales at large n, it goes as n to the three halves. But of course, this is a two derivative statement, and we're interested how it gets corrected uh, at subleading order in n. Um, so here is where I'm embracing my ignorance, but I'm also a little bit knowledgeable. So what I know is that this combination L square over two G Newton in my 4D action is going to scale as N to the three halves with a coefficient big A, which is going to depend on the CFT, on the details of the model. Little A is something which I'm allowing for. I'm allowing for this combination to get a correction, if you wish a quantum, correction, a one over n correction, which I parameterized. I, I don't know this coefficient and I call it little a. Ci are going to scale as n to the one half as it as was already discussed. And then I normalize it in a certain way. So vi, uh, v1, v2, little a and big a are constants, which at the moment I don't know, but they're not going to scale with n. Uh, and so I just shove all of this in my own shell action and I find this formula, okay? And so now with this at hand, this on shell action for a given choice of the boundary, uh, whether it's a three sphere or a squashed sphere or S1 times the Riemann surface, I, I, I should be able to compute with the partition function of the dual CFT. And this is what I'm going to use. So I'm going to fix these constants, or at least these combinations of the constants, which appear in the on-shell action. I will fix them by using results from SUSY localization at large n for two uh, specific examples of CFTs, okay? This will be the logic. So the two models that I'm going to study are 
the ABGM at level K, which arises from the sasaki einstein manifold being S7 mod ZK, where the ZK acts in a certain way that keeps N equals to six SUSY. The other class of models is again an orbifold of the sphere, S7, but the orbifold acts in a, in a slightly different way uh, that keeps N equals four SUSY. And it leads to this UN N equals four Young Mills coupled to one R joint and NF hyperspace. Uh, when k is equal to one and nf is equal to one, these two models are actually dual to each other. So in a special case, model two is dual or at, in the IR to model one at k equals one. But otherwise, they're distinct classes of CFTs. Okay, for these two models, I choose them because uh, uh, nicely enough, various people have computed precisely what I need for these models. So what I need is the round sphere three, uh, free energy, uh, uh, the n to the three halves and the n to the one half terms in it. From that, I can compute capital A as well as a combination of these unknown constants. And then CT has also been computed in this model. Uh, if you're interested, I can explain how, but anyway, you can find the details in these papers. So I know CT and the round sphere. If this is enough for me to, to fix completely the QFT answer for the partition function, notably on all three manifolds, okay? So the choice of three manifold, to remind you, determines this chi and this curly F, okay? So I, for these two CFTs, I know the full answer for any three manifold for. Wait, uh, wait, wait, wait. Sorry, sorry, sorry. The Euler character of an oriented three manifold of a compact oriented three manifold is zero. Is that chi of the four manifold? Yes, it's chi of the, of the filling, if you wish, of the three manifold. I don't know if that's the correct term. Uh, just and the chi. And that's unique? Uh, well, good, good, excellent. So what I'm assuming is that this. Four manifold caps off smoothly. So, for example, I, I know that this is possible on the on the squashed uh, sphere. I know that it's possible for S1 times S2, S1 times the Riemann surface. So, for a bunch of examples, which are also relevant for localization, I, I know that this is uh, there is a smooth filling, if you wish, but I I don't want to claim anything more than that. Okay. Um, good. So, uh, good. Uh, I have the, these explicit answers now for the QFT quantities. Uh, uh, well, converted to QFT quantities. So K is again the rank of the orbifold. NF is the number of fundamentals. So, if you're interested in, in ABGM at level K, I can spit out some answers for you for the leading and the subleading term in this large N expansion. Okay, so an interesting consistency check is that, uh, so this, uh, so, some people observe that the squashed sphere localization answer for a uh, uh, very special value of the squashing parameter for ABGM and for this other model has something to do with the topological string, uh, the matrix model arising in the topological string on on various manifolds, I'm not gonna go into detail, but this person computed uh, uh, these quantities precisely and, and they agree with what we have. When you take the, the squashed sphere with this value. Okay, but we also have some things that, that haven't been computed in general by SUSY localization. So I know that there's some people in the audience who are experts, so you should pay attention probably now. Uh, so, for the squashed S3, for ABJM uh, at large n, fixed, but otherwise arbitrary k, uh, and general value of the squashing B, here is the answer for the leading and the subleading term. Okay? This, as far as I'm aware, has not been computed by localization for general values of B, uh, so it will be nice to check. Another, uh, specific example of our equations is when I take this so-called 
topologically twisted index that was defined by Benini and Zaffaroni and then computed for ABGM by Benini, Christoph Zaffaroni for a special value of the twist on sigma g, of what we call the universal twist, when you twist with the U1R symmetry, basically. Uh, and then this is the answer for this index to leading and sub-leading order for ABGM. Uh, for when g was equal, is equal to zero, when, when I have a sphere here, uh, S1 times S2, this was computed numerically in, in a paper uh, quoted here, but otherwise for arbitrary G, this is a new result as far as I know. Okay. In addition, I, I'm not gonna give you explicit examples, but the same quantities in the table here, this capital A, A plus V2 and V1 can be used to write down explicit formulas for the entropy of any asymptotic lady S4 S7 black hole in M theory. So the subleading term in the entropy will be captured by our uh, equations. Good. Uh, okay, so this is all I had to say. So ju just a brief recap. Uh, what I did is I adopted this kind of ignorant approach to higher derivative M theory, which is just to reduce on some manifold X7, reduce in my head, and then imagine that I get a 4D supergravity with an expansion in higher derivatives, look at the leading order piece, and then try to organize everything in terms of those leading order corrections. Uh, we studied the, the implications of all of this for um, holography, so things I've, I've talked about are the on-shell action, uh, CT, as well as the spectrum of operators in the DOCT, or part of the spectrum of operators. Uh, we also studied how this affects black hole physics, entropy, thermodynamics, and finally, I showed you how to use this approach in 4D supergravity with SUSY localization to fix the unknown coefficients, which then in turn leads you to some novel QFT results at large n. Okay, what's the homework assignment? Well, here's a bunch of homework assignments. Some of them we're working on. So clearly you should be asking, well, if I have a general Sasaki Einstein manifold, I'll have many total climb modes. These will lead to matter fields in four dimensions. So I should be studying matter coupled for the supergravity. And indeed, you can do this at least when uh, the internal manifold is a seven sphere to some extent. So we're working on this. Of course, the philosophy of all this should be uh, extendable to 5D, 6D, and 7D supergravity, we're thinking about all of this now. Um, you can then move on and say, can I use additional SUSY to kind of relate this constants C1 and C2? So N equals four SUSY or maybe N equals eight is going to completely fix the constants. N equals eight is not easy because I don't have an off shell formulation, but N equals four might be barely doable. Uh, anyway, so, as I said, uh, we have some results that should be of interest to localization uh, on a squashed S3, but also on other uh, ciphered like manifolds. Anything that is uh, preserved by, uh, that preserves a certain peeling vector that you can localize with respect to, uh, you can presumably fit into our story. And we have explicitly computed the n to the one half uh, terms in those partition functions. I've uh, focused here on models arising from M theory, uh, re re reduced to 4D, but nothing stops me from studying uh, other examples of 3D n equals to two holographic CFTs in the same way. Uh, things arising from uh, D2, D8 brains, which means massive 2A, the leading order scaling is n to the five thirds. Very little is known about the subleading order. Uh, wrap D48 brains on a Riemann surface. This leads to 3D n equals to two CFTs with n to the five half scaling, the free energy. Uh, and then of course, wrap them five brains or class R if you wish. Uh, they, these are 3D n equals to two CFTs with n cubed scaling. Again, in all of these examples, little is known about the subleading terms. And hopefully our approach may be of some help there. Uh, I, 
emphasized a few times that I'm doing the reduction from 11D to 4D in my head. Well, this is because I'm weak, uh, but maybe someone is strong enough to do it, you know, really and compute C1 and C2 by using uh, results in 11D or 10D supergravity. Uh, and the last thing is something that was asked, I think, by Greg Moore is about these sub sub leading if you so the log n term in the ABGM free energy is should be related to um, uh, cold cyclic modes running in loops around ADS4. Uh, uh, and then there will be sub leading terms of the type n to the minus integer over two. These terms should presumably be related to six derivatives and eight derivatives and so on in 40 supergravity. We have some ideas how to approach this in some of the cases that we've studied, but nothing particularly specific at this point. All right, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Any questions? May I ask one question? Uh, so, so in the, your second class, uh, example, your second example, so 3D n equal 4 with uh, fundamental, mm -hmm. is the gravity dual smooth? Um, I'm wondering that the gravity dual is I, added four times a stable constant to an app, something like that. And uh, I think, I, I guess think, there's I, Think this is an orbif uh, 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 a smooth orbifold. It was studied uh, by the, these people. Uh, so Mark Meze and Silvio Pufu studied it uh, in their paper. Uh, I think in this case it is a smooth uh, a smooth orbifold. But maybe someone else would know in more detail. Okay. If there are no more questions, thank the speaker one more time. And, and I have a comment. So, so you mentioned that the uh, MPI brain, what's the MPI brain cases? And uh, yes. actually that uh, we computed uh, some survey right, right. correction. Right, the, so you, yes, I, I have to be a bit, a bit more specific. Indeed, uh, Dong Min has been working very hard on computing corrections to N cubed by using not theory on the hyperbolic manifold that you use to obtain to wrap this M5 frames on. No, no, no we also use the closed M manifold, not the, the not, not complement. So, okay. yeah, we, we, we consider the internal manifold is a compact closed okay, okay. manifold. Yes. But the, yeah. so the point is that, okay, this may, this may allow me to fix a linear combination of the constants. So, so, you'll see that I need, if you wish, I need two data points from the QFT to be able to, to fix the full answer. Roughly speaking, you can use the S3 free energy and CT. So I think you have the S3 free energy only, or maybe if you have the S3 free energy and the index, for example, it may work. Okay, thank you. But if you only have the S3 free energy, you will fix only a part of this answer, if you wish. Yeah, I think uh, we know the three sphere free energy and uh, some twist index and the sub okay. leading. Okay, then then and, uh, it yeah. it may work. Yes. I, I... Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, let's thank the speaker one more time. Thank you. Thanks.